So howdy, y'all. This is the Common Constitutionalist coming at you once again with the Common Constitutionalist weekly podcast. And once again, I have but one topic, and uh, this is this is going to be about the about what uh, what everybody feels is the the greatest university in the country, maybe the world, Harvard University, the elite of the elite, and the dichotomy of being the best university in, on in the country and the worst at the same time. So I'll discuss that today on The Common Constitutionalist. You are listening to The Common Constitutionalist, broadcasting from an undisclosed location, free from the prying eyes of establishment black helicopters. Get this party started. Okay, so my son was recently uh, accepted into a college, and so last week we went to the college admitted students open house day, for want of a better term. I think that's what they call it. And as colleges and universities go, this is a relatively, shall we say, conservative school, for want of a better term. And during the open house, they had uh, they had in their in their uh, arena for uh, I guess it's yeah I guess they call it an arena. They had all these tables and booths laid out and whatnot for different clubs and different functions and classes and different you know the, whatever your your uh, your major is going to be. You can go by and visit that table. Whatever club you might want to join, you go by and visit that table, and. I look. I start looking around at this place, and and again, this is a relatively conservative school, and I didn't want to believe it, but I I was doing what I do, writing, podcasting, doing all this other nonsense. Um, you get in tune to this stuff. You get attuned to what you should expect, even when you expect it. It 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 still is a bit of a surprise to actually see it in action. And we're walking through this, and they've got the the Young Republicans Club, and they've got the Young Democrats Club, and they've got all these other clubs, sporting clubs, and all this other stuff. And then they have the Multiculturalism Club, and they have the (laughs) brand new club, the newest, the latest thing on campus, the Social Justice Club. Oh, baby. Hooray for the Social Justice Club. And unfortunately, well, whatever. I'm not going to bother to go into that. So you would expect this from liberal universities, of which we hear from all the time, you don't necessarily expect it from uh, cons- more conservative colleges and universities, although there are not many out there, so, you know, whatever. So, anyway, I, I came home and I started thinking about this thing, and I went on one of the websites that I rely on, Campus Reform, the College Fix, and whatnot, and I'm thinking about what to podcast today, and it just Basically, it just jumps off the screen at me. And once again, it's the elite of the elite, Harvard University, is the supposedly the best university and, in my opinion, the worst university. I, frankly, wouldn't even let my son apply to Harvard because he is a white male, a conservative white male. He's a wanted, he'd have a wanted poster out the first day that he got there. On, he'd, he'd, they'd have a bounty on his head. So, anywho, I just perused the college fix, and in one week, they had articles that, that, that ran for one week, and in one week, I found four separate articles about the unbelievable off-the-chain liberalism at Harvard, the radicalism at Harvard, and it is astonishing how pathetic the, uh, the people at Harvard are, the staff, the faculty the administration, and the students. It's just pitiful. It's mind-boggling. So let's just start with the first one, shall we? On, Har- on, on Not on the campus, but Harvard has these things called final clubs, and they're, 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 they're clubs that you can join that aren't part of, they're not affiliated with the university. They're off campus. They don't have any affiliation with the university. They don't take any money from the university. They're completely separate from the university, all right? Some of them, oh no, are single gender clubs. Egad, that's tragic. And some of them are not just single gender, 
but they're male only, and that just won't do uh, at, in the uh, in the current Harvard University atmosphere. And the first one I discovered at the College Fix is the single gender clubs must go because of their oftentimes toxic atmosphere, which reeks of elitism and discrimination. Elitism, that's a hot one, huh? And they stand in contrast to the diverse and socially conscious students of Harvard said, egad. So the, uh, the students and some faculty at Harvard want to get rid of single gender clubs. Nope. Let me rephrase that. The students and, and faculty at Harvard want to get rid of the, only the male single gender clubs. The female single gender clubs, oh, they're fine. They're Jim freaking dandy but not the male ones, no, of course, because they reek of elitism and discrimination and have a toxic atmosphere. Oh, and also a rape culture, of course, don't you know? So the uh, College Fix writes that an administration committee is recommending the proposal to uh, stymie tox toxic male-only clubs should go forward. Okay, so they're going to stop the male, leaving female-only clubs unaffected for now. So that's really fair, isn't it? That's just terrific. Members of the, ready? Gender Violence Legal Policy Workshop at Harvard, which is a, a it's a four-credit class. You can take the Gender Violence Legal Policy Workshop at Harvard and get credit for it. But they're not happy. They're not happy that they that the uh, single gender male only clubs are going to be forced now by the school to go co-ed. That's not, that's not satisfactory. That's not radical enough for these people. And it never is. Leftists are never satisfied. It won't matter what you propose. Frankly, they're like, uh, they're like the Palestinian, uh, the PLO and Hamas. No matter what Israel uh, recommends, no matter how much land and freedom they give, it's never going to be enough to, for the Palestinians. It's the same thing with the gender violence legal workshop people. It's never going to be enough. They are dismayed to learn that sexual assault prevention is no longer the driving force behind the sanctions. So they not only have to go co-ed, but they have to change their charter to include that uh, sexual assault uh, prevention is the, uh, is the driving force behind the new charter. That's what they have to do in order to stay in order to stay in existence. This committee, members of the Gender Violence Legal Workshop at Harvard, wrote that forcing organizations, I love this, forcing, and it just it just rolls off the tongue like it's no big deal. Forcing organizations to become co ed cannot alone protect women from the realities of campus sexual assault. No Words will, though. If you just simply change the charter and reword it somehow, that's going to make all the difference in the world because words are so powerful. Give me a freaking break. But uh, advocates against this policy spoke out, and they said that Dean Rakesh Kurani's threat to punish male students for simply being members of single-sex single clubs is, quote, one more step toward the erosion of college students' constitutional rights. Well, of course it is, but what's that have to do with Harvard? They only teach constitutional law and government, but pff, what the heck. They also say, they reiterate what I already said, by design these are private societies located off campus, off campus on privately held land, unlike fraternity chapters of the Greek uh, system, which usually have an affiliation with their host institutions they have no official connection with Harvard, and they are under no compunction to change their membership policies to fulfill the university's ideal of itself. But that doesn't make any freaking difference to Harvard. They're going to force them to do it anyway, or they're going to blackball them, for want of a better term. So that was one fun topic of four. Let's take a break, and we'll go on to the next fun topic. <laughs> You're listening to me, the Common Constitutionalist. Yeah, baby! Yeah. Okay, welcome back. Now for our next topic, again from the College Fix. All four of these are from the College Fix, and like I said earlier, 
all four of them just leapt off the page. They were all within a week's happening, and they're just all just great things happening in America, home of the free, uh, home of the brave, free of the brave. Yeah, we're <laughs> free of the brave. That's the ticket. Okay, so anyway, here we go. The College Fix writes, Ever wonder what the head of a university presidential task force for inclusion and belonging does? May I, as an aside, mention, isn't this Harvard University? They're supposed to be the elite of the elite, the smartest of the smart, the best and the brightest. And they have a presidential task force for inclusion and belonging. Doesn't including it doesn't inclusion and belonging, isn't that a bit redundant? At first I thought this was an acronym that they had to put something like governments always do these acronyms so it sounds great or you know democrats and republicans always they make up these dopey uh organizations and they fashion them around an acronym you know a hope or change or whatever the heck but this is P presidential task force for inclusion and belonging so that would be pacific um that doesn't it doesn't it doesn't roll off the tongue. It's, it doesn't doesn't do anything for me. But anyway, so you ever wonder what they do? Well, stuff like this they write. Changing the lyric here. Um, you're going to love this one, baby. Yeah. And it's high time they did this. Those dirty dogs in the, uh, in the 19th century. Dadgummit. Here we go. Changing the lyrics of an almost two-century-old anthem. Yep, the Harvard song, the Harvard anthem. They want to change it because it's not inclusive or belonging. That it reeks of uh, white male dominance or some such nonsense. What's, what, that's exactly what it does. It reeks of white male dominance. So government professor Daniel, Danielle, excuse me, S. Allen. You know, I, I don't want to sound sexist, but it's just always, it's, uh, ah, whatever, I'll leave that alone. So Daniel S. Allen, the co-chair of just such a task force at Harvard, announced plans to alter the final line of the school's 181-year-old alma mater, Fair Harvard. So that's the song. They call it Fair Harvard. I don't happen to know it. Don't care. Even, even if you did know it, it won't make any difference because they're going to be changing it shortly anyway. Okay. The offensive lyrics are, uh, read, the, this is the last line of the song, and that's what they want to change. And I'm sure they'll get around to changing some other stuff later, but for now, they just want to set the precedent to be able to change something, I'm sure. The offensive lyric reads, Till the stock of Puritans die. Puritans, oh heavens, that ain't good. Um, well, uh, we won't bother to go into what the Puritans stood for, but uh, the New England was founded by the Puritans, and they, they are they're just the Harvard is not liking the fact that the Puritans are included in this song. But that's not all. Hey, <laughs> you thought the fun was over, did you? Well, it ain't. This one, <laughs> you either got to laugh or cry. Allen's group, Danielle S. Allen, co-chair of the Presidential Task Force for Inclusion and Redundancy, Belonging, their group is launch <laughs> I just can't stand it. The group is launching a second competition for a a new musical variant of the Fair Harvard song of the alma mater song that <laughs> that could be performed as electronic hip hop or spoken word music. Uh, <laughs> I can't. And their inspiration was from the play, the musical Hamilton, because it's so inclusive, inclusive and belonging, the play Hamilton. Yes, indeedy. The group's website stresses that the point is to use your imagination, because that's a good thing. Imagination. They assure people that such a variant would not displace the original right away. No, they didn't say that. I just added that. It would, however, serve as an endorsed alternative so that they get up, the uh, the Harvard Choir can get up there and do a boom, 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 hip-hop beat to Fair Harvard and get rid of them daggum Puritans, you know what I'm saying? And also at the Presidential Task Force for Inclusion and Belonging, they had an event 
called the Afternoon of Engagement on Inclusion and Belonging. That's terrific. And students were invited to share their stories of inclusion and, I'm sure, non-inclusion, of diversity, inclusion, and belonging that are fundamental to our missions and to our identity and essential for creating a better university. Because I guess Harvard isn't the greatest university on the planet if it can be better, new and improved, and the responsibility for that is one shared by students, faculty, and, sh and staff. Isn't that fabulous? Individuals from across the university then took to the stage to discuss their personal experiences with belonging and how they felt about belonging and not belonging because it's all about how you feel. Liberalism, elitism, and progressivism, radical, whatever, leftism, it's all about how you feel and only how you feel. It's not about learning anything at Harvard. It's not about paying sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year to learn anything at Harvard. It's going there to be included and be and feel belonged or belonged. Okay, what, whatever. Who cares? See, I told you I didn't go to Harvard. One who took to the stage and uh, described her experiences was one Eden H. Germa, who related how she and other protesters at an event wanted to observe ninety seconds of silence for dig this black men killed by police during the primal scream, the biannual naked run around Harvard Yard before the first day of finals. That's fabulous. Germa said, thinking back to that experience with all of the emotions that I had, I can only see at the moment. That seems so clear to me, seeing two Harvards. One, a student body that felt so intrinsically implicated in the violence and what was happening in the world and the other seemed so blind to me, said 18-year-old skull full of mush, Eden H. Germa. Give me a break. So that's our second topic. So now we have Harvard changing their song because it's not inclusive and it has those dirty white Puritans in it, and enforcing all-male single-gender clubs off-campus, not related to anything having to do with Harvard, to change the co-ed and, uh, and admit they're all rapists, basically. So let's take a break, and we'll get to our third fun topic, shall we? You're listening to the Common Constitution. Let the truth be known. Be known. Okay, welcome back once again. And our next topic regarding Harvard. Harvard's a busy place for radicals, that is. There is a there's a new student organization called the Open Campus Initiative, and I frankly have no idea how this one even got started because it is conservative. So how in the blank did that ever happen on Harvard campus? I'll be honest with you, I have no idea. So the college fix uh, says that the open cancer, open, open cancer, right? <laughs> Might as well be, right? The Open Campus Initiative is making a splashy debut by hosting University of Toronto prof, uh, psychology professor Jordan Peterson next week. The Harvard Crimson reports breathlessly. Da, da, da. Peterson has become, <laughs> I get a love in this one too, baby. Peterson has become a pariah in Canada for refusing. Okay, sit down, duct tape your head. There you go. You ready? Here we go. For refusing to use gender neutral pronouns and warning that a purported civil rights bill would criminalize a person's refusal to use another person's preferred gender pronoun, such as Z. You, rem you know these, these terms, these new terms that are g supposedly gender neutral that we're going to be forced to use? Z, Zer, Zim, Zibbity, Zoo. I don't even freaking know, nor do I care, because no matter, you could torture me and I'm not going to say Z. <laughs> I just forget you, brother. So Healy, um, this guy Healy, who's the head of the Open Campus Initiative, noted that there is a 27-year-old faculty resolution that endorses the freedom of campus groups to hold speaking events without interruption, and his group wants to see if the university will honor that commitment. Guess what? They won't. 
end of end of story. Naturally, opposing students are planning a response, arguing that refusing to use gender neutral. Here we go again. Here we remember words hurt more than sticks and stones. Dig, they don't. <laughs> Uh, and bullets and all sorts of things. Words just hurt. Oh, opposing students are planning a response, arguing that refusing to use gender-neutral pronouns engenders violence against transgender students and is not protected speech. If you substituted any other protected class of people for the trans people, it would be appalling. And the only reason it's not appalling is because we allow violence against trans people to be normalized. Lily M. Valona 18-year-old said, another 18-year-old skull full of, it's not even mush, it's skull full of crap, frankly. It normalizes, Valona went on, Lily, Lily of the Valley went on to say, it normalizes the idea that trans people, <laughs> trans people, uh, transcontinental people, are less than human, less than other humans. It normalizes the idea that we can refuse to acknowledge the personhood by putting it up for for debate, oh, gee whiz, of any uh, of an incredibly vulnerable group of people. So basically, unless you use Z, Zer, Zim, Zibidi, Zoo, whatever they want you to use, you're, in you're engendering violence. So words equal violence, don't you know? There you go. So that's the next. That was the next fun topic. I don't know if they're going to be able to refuse the freedom of speech on campus. Uh, but I guarantee you they're not going to let this guy speak without protesting him, shouting him down, and hopefully frustrating him to the point where he'll just say, you know what the heck, this is not worth it, and leave. Because that's what these radical fools do. These skulls full of crap do. They have no idea what they're talking about. Words and gender violence automatically. It's just These guys... It, it, they really need to get a clue, but going to Harvard, they don't have to get a clue because basically what they're going to do is they're either going to end up uh, in some think tank in Washington, a lobbyist group in Washington, or working for the government or some such thing, uh, working for some politician. That's what they're being groomed to do. Or, excuse me, working as spreading the word in some other university as a professor. That's what they're groomed to do at Harvard. So let's take one more short break, and we'll get right back to the fun and frivolity. Yeesh. You're listening to The Common Constitutionalist. Let the truth be known. All right, welcome back for the, la the fourth and final segment here of Harvard University, the most leftist radical university in America. Maybe Berkeley, I don't know. We'll, we have, that's, that's, that's like a 1-1-A one, one type of thing any rate, the final topic is this thing called, there's a thing out there called the free speech bus. And it's a bus that travels around the country. Um, and and it's, it's, it's sponsored by the National Organization for Marriage. And boy, howdy, not a good idea to land at Harvard. And the, uh, the, the Crimson, uh, the Harvard Crimson refers to the vehicle as the anti-transgender bus. So you know where this is going, right? So I'll make this quick, but the anti-transgender bus, the free speech bus, rolls into Harvard and is met by and greeted, they greeted by 30 protesters. Yeah, they greeted them all right. The National Association, National Organization of Marriage, Joseph Gabowski, said he had hoped to have a reasonable discussion with the students at Harvard. Boy, he didn't do his homework on Harvard, did he? No, sir. So the the bus rolls up and is greeted by 30 protesters. They all gather around him shouting all sorts of uh, anti-gender slurs at this guy. One person tries to put a rainbow flag around about Grabowski. And the activists shouted, trans lives matter and stand up, fight back, and all other sorts of dopey leftist slogans. And then they, uh, they as Grabowski exited the, uh, the, the bus and went on his merry way on campus, wherever he was supposed to be speaking, these 30 wonderful little skulls full of crap uh, students decided they would paint graffiti all over the bus. So they they not only uh, weren't welcoming to this guy as the, for the free speech bus, 
but they also graffitied the crap out of his bus. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It, there, there's, no, there's no indication that these kids even got in trouble for doing this. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately for the, free, the Freedom Bus, on the side of the Freedom Bus, uh, is, uh, is written in bold letters the words, It's biology. Boys are boys and always will be. Girls are girls and always will be. You can't change sex. Uh, that uh, that went over like a lead balloon to the 30 skull full of crap too. They uh, they deemed it the hate speech bus, and uh, and they claimed that hate is not welcome here. Of course not. Anything that they don't agree with is hate naturally. And Grabowski said about the protest that unfortunately it's a very one-sided policy debate right now because of the fact that a noisy minority has been able to shout down the other side. That's the way the noisy minority works, Mr. Grabowski. You should know that by now. You've probably been to enough colleges and received enough hate mail and whatnot and protests to, uh, to have learned that by now. But uh, bully for you to, for keeping it up. That's pretty brave of you, brother. But you're not going to get anywhere with these idiots. If you're out there to change hearts and minds, uh, you, might try some, you might try some other colleges and universities because the, the, the faculty, administration, and students at Harvard are completely closed off to anything reasonable, or, and they, don't, they do not want a debate or a discussion on the issues. They can't handle that. That is, in fact, hate speech. So that's all I've got for today. This is the Common Constitutionalist signing off once again. Y'all have a fabulous balance of the week, or weekend at least. And I will talk at you next weekend, God willing, and the creek don't rise. And actually in New England, because of all the rain and snow melt, the creek has been <laughs> rising pretty rapidly. So pray for me, brother. That's all I got. Common Constitutionalist signing off. I'm out. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Common Constitutionalist Weekly Podcast.